As I stand here this morning ready to give my testimony on how I came to know the Messiah of Israel, Jesus, I just want to say if there are any Jewish people in the audience today, this might be offensive to you. And I can understand that. My mother was very much that way. But I ask you just right now, just to put those things aside for a minute, to open your heart and just to listen to another person's point of view. If you're a Christian here today, having come from various denominations, from the country or the city, I ask you also to hear the personal testimony of how God did an amazing work in a person's life. If you were invited here today by somebody and you don't know Jesus and you may be even fidgety right now and not really very interested in who Jesus is or whether he's of any value to you, I can understand that. But I ask you also just to listen attentively to someone else's life for a little while. And maybe, just maybe, you will be able to tap in to that other world that exists here, right here this morning. It's all around you. It's another world that you can't see with your heart or your eyes. But it exists, even more so than the world that you see now. And I hope that what I have to say this morning will help you at least to look into that world. It's not to make you decide to become a Christian or to even believe in Jesus. But for me to tell you that for me, he exists and has proven himself to be the answer that I have for my life. I was born in Perth in 1950. My family, who are English, had come out after the war. My father, from a, a Polish background of 13 sons, Orthodox family, very Orthodox, and my mother also from a Russian background, his family was Orthodox. When they arrived here, they left behind them some of the fullness of that Orthodoxy and became what you might call liberal Jews. In other words, not completely committed to the full law of Moses, but certainly involved in the synagogue and in the activities of all the various festivals and Jewish life in general. My father, when I was young, six and seven years of age, was already the president of the B'nai B'rith. This is sort of a Red Cross society of the Jewish community who go out and do uh, good works to help the elderly of the Jewish people and, and other various things. And he was a respected and important Jewish person in Western Australia. And regularly the rabbis would come back and forward in my home and there'd be meetings about fundraising and, and all sorts of things. And so my, my life was full of activity and various Jewish things and festival, but not to the depth of ultra-Orthodoxy. And I went to Haida, which is like Sunday school, and learnt to speak Hebrew, although unfortunately I have wasted away in these days. I don't know it very well at all. And I became an intrinsic part of the Jewish community as a whole. But I was a wayward boy like everybody else. There was a, an unfortunate burden which Jewish people tend to put upon their children. And I do believe it's because of the oppression of World War II and Hitler and other things that Jewish people have always had an ultimate desire to see their children succeed, almost live out their life through their children. And day after day, my mother would say to me, ignorant as she was, you must do better than the Christians at school. You've got to succeed. You've got to achieve. Now, before I go any further, I think it's very important that you realize that the majority of Jewish people perceive that all peoples of the earth that aren't Jewish are Christian. Muslims are Christian. Hindus are Christians. Hare Krishnas are Christians. Everybody that isn't Jewish is Christian because they have a warped perspective of what Christianity is. They only know there's them, the Jewish people, and there's the rest of the world, and they're Christians. They've misused the word Christianity for the word Gentile. But nevertheless, my mother's motivation was through having difficult times when she was in London during the war, having bricks thrown through her window and swastikas put on her front door, because when the blitz bombs used to come across from France, from Germany into London, the local East End Londoners used to hate the Jews and blame them that the bombs were coming. And so there was a fairly strong onslaught of attack towards the Jewish people in those areas in London. So when my mother came out here, she was determined, as all Jewish mothers are, that her son was going to be a, 
a lawyer, a doctor, a solicitor, someone of astute circumstances. So should Hitler and his mob or anti-Semitism rise up to such a degree in their life, they would at least be in a position of authority to stifle and put off this oppression that might be coming towards them. So there I was in primary school doing my hardest to be a good student, but I was a hopeless student. I couldn't fidget, I couldn't sit still. The only thing I knew I was good at, and that was playing marbles in the playground. I used to make a lot of money in lunchtime, and it was my first business activity. But I was a failure in my primary school. In fact, I became so bad in being able to achieve the desires of my mother and father that the marvels and the inventiveness of creating other businesses, I started to influence people through having money in my pocket because I would learn to make money at six and seven and eight years of age and I could influence other people at school to do what I wanted. By the time I was 13, I was an uncontrollable boy who did not know anything about schooling. I had lost it completely and I knew that there was power in having sufficient money in my pocket so that I could buy people's friendship. I made a big mess of it, but I was musically minded and I had already learned how to play the accordion quite well and I was now playing around with a guitar and my parents had decided that it was good for me to get away from the environment that I was in in high school. This was my first six months and asked me if I would like to join the Australian Apprenticeship for Musicians in the Australian Army and that I'd be sent away from Perth to Melbourne, which I was very excited about at the age of 13 and a half. I don't believe that apprenticeship is available anymore, but in those days I did get enlisted and I was enlisted for nine years to be away from my parents, only to see them two weeks of the year in the middle of the year in June. I thought it was gonna be a great. When I got there, I got the shock of my life. There was disciplinary attitudes that was beyond my wildest dreams. My parents weren't there to defend me. There was terrible boyish pranks. There was forcefulness. I was a fat, round, tubby little boy having eaten Jewish food from the day I was born until I was 13. And now they were demanding me to run five miles every morning. And when I'd run 100 m meters and couldn't last any longer, you'd think they'd let me off. No, they pulled me the extra four and three quarter miles until I made the distance. Fortunately enough, after three or four months, I was running that five miles. I had lost nearly three stone. I was as thin as a twig and as full of effervescence and energy and muscle tone. I was a new person, but I rebelled to the lifestyle that the army gave me. On the weekends, I was performing in jazz and Dixieland bands as a clarinet player and breaking all the rules. There was just something in me that was uncontrollable. Maybe some of you Jewish people and non-Jewish parents here today might know what it is to have a rebellious child in your life in these days. There's certainly plenty of it around. But I was determined to live my life and yet get the advantages out of this army school. Eventually I became so difficult at the age of 20, I appealed to my parents. I had three years more to go, I had done six years and I asked them to discharge me, that I was free, I'd learnt many instruments, I could play proficiently, I was now ready to set the world on fire. But my father, having been an army man from the beginning, said, no son, finish the three years, it's good for you. But I rebelled and I decided to run away. By now I was not in Melbourne anymore, but had finished my qualifications as an apprentice musician and I was a qualified musician in many instruments and I was living in Sydney and I was connected to the barracks there. And I went what they call AWOL. I ran away from the army forces. And I went and set up an office almost across the road from the, from the army barracks and started a booking agency. Not that I rejoice over this arrogance and presumption, but it's amazing how God can watch over you. Here I was being chased around all over Australia by the military police trying to arrest me. And across the road, I had an office as a booking agent booking out all the members of the army band for weekend concerts. They weren't going to tell the army what was happening because I was making them an extra hundred dollars a week on Saturday. And for two years I was across the road without them being able to find me. One day somebody came into the office I was, and said, look, we're looking for a band to go to Vietnam to entertain the American troops. It's a thousand dollars a week per person, accommodation, flight there and back for three months. 
I looked at him with a big grin and I said, I don't know who the rest of the people are, but I'm one of them. And that's how it was. I found another three people and I was ready to fly to Vietnam at $1,000 a week. I had become what some people understand and misrepresent Jewish people to be, a money maker. $1,000 a week in 1970 was an awful lot of money. And at 20 years of age, I was out to get it. There was no doubt. And somehow in my heart, I was trying to prove to my mother and my father, look, I have achieved things, but not in the way that you set them out to do. And I had this driving force behind me, must succeed, must succeed. My Jewishness had been left behind a little. As you can imagine by now, having been in the army six years, the, uh, the catering corps were cooking pork, ham, bacon and everything else. And I hadn't a care in the world anymore. Although my parents might have had some other thoughts about it, as liberal as they were. A lot of my Jewish relationships and people and, and the Hebrew that I'd learned had been washed away. And now I was a dynamic 20 year old with several instruments under my arm about to take over the world. But there was a small problem. I didn't have a passport. My parents had my birth certificate and I couldn't get it from them because for sure they'd know that I was some, up to something and they would have informed the army police. I would have been arrested and brought back to the barracks. So with gall beyond my wildest dream, I went up to where you get a passport in the city of Sydney and went to a telephone booth just outside and put a handkerchief over the telephone and muffled my voice and went beep, 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 beep. This is the Perth Registrar ringing. I'd like to let you know that a gentleman has rang us by the name of David Chris, who urgently needs confirmation of his birth certificate. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it to you in the mail in time for him to fly to his destination. So here is his particulars. He was born in June 1950, brown hair of Mr. and Mrs. Golder and Harry Chris. His height is five foot eight. And then I realized I'd made the biggest mistake. I had told them on my birth certificate I was five foot eight. Surely I was in the biggest trouble I'd ever experienced. And when I went into that office, there would be police waiting for me and I would be arrested. Never has there ever been five foot eight written on a birth certificate. After the conversation, I hung up, still desperate that I was going to achieve this goal, get out of the country, have a passport, travel the world, and just prove to my parents that I had succeeded in something. I got into the passport office and unbelieving to my own eyes, the passport was waiting for me completely stamped and ready, and I was flying that night to Vietnam. Beyond my wildest dreams, I had got away with this, or as some of you Christians would know, the Lord's hand was upon my life. I'd been in Vietnam one day, the exciting smells and all the various things that were going on caused me to be very excited. Within 24 hours, I was already smoking marijuana. I was already tasting what it was to have opium. I was high as a kite, dancing and singing and carrying on with all the GIs who had a hopelessness in their heart for all they wanted to do was be at home. They were in a faraway country and the Vietnamese people had provided various forms of drugs and alcohol and women and everything else you can imagine to alleviate these anxieties. There I was participating with them, feeling that I'd got away with murder, so to speak. I had succeeded in getting out of Australia without a pass. I thought I was terrific and real smart. Three days later, the band was booked to go out to some army camps and we'd been rehearsing and everything was fine and still being a fairly proficient musician, this became easy. But now I was a hip dude, so to speak, always having my packet of marijuana with me and always a bit high all the time and finding everything a joke. We were on stage one day in the middle of the bush performing and entertaining to the GIs who were burdened that they were far away from their own home and all of a sudden a mortar came straight across the stage and nearly blew up the camp. But for the first time in my life I realised why I was getting a thousand dollars a week and that life was so easily disposed of and that no matter what drugs I'd been taking and what I'd been carrying on and as a foolish young person I was in the middle of a war zone and I'd been changed from that day. I managed to get out of Vietnam alive, found myself in England next as a base for touring and performing all over Europe. 
I travelled right through Europe to Turkey and eventually 52 countries through the P&O ships and other forms of entertainment booking contracts that I received, supporting artists and performing with bands. I returned some 10 years later to Australia, well and truly engulfed in the music industry, consumed by music in all forms, from its performance to its management. But when I did arrive back, I was fairly well received because people had remembered me and the things that I'd done in the early days. And it took very little time for me to get back into the management of music. And I settled down in Sydney and started a management agency. In those days, I had bands like Moving Pictures, In Excess. These were all young bands. I was dealing with Dragon and My Sex and Midnight Oil and many others. Once again, still in the drug scene and the high flying times. It was only a matter of months before I had a Mercedes Benz and trucks and PA systems and I had a restaurant and I was going at great guns as a young entrepreneur. One day the North Sydney Council contacted me and said that they wanted to promote Sundays in the Park and they wanted to help the youth of North Sydney keep off the streets and would I be prepared to put up a package of entertainment for each Sunday for several Sundays in a row that would attract these youth to give them a good relationship with their council. They sent out over a liaison officer by the name of Carol. When I met Carol, it was only a matter of minutes and I was deeply engulfed and interested in her and her in me. She was the personal secretary to the mayor. Within two weeks, she left working for the mayor and came to be my personal secretary. I had fallen in love with her deeply. She was a Jewish woman and we had an exciting life together, going around, seeing the different bands, deciding who I would book and who I wouldn't book. But she had some commitments in her old life, having come to know me. And one weekend she was away in the Blue Mountains and unfortunately had a major car accident where a car drove into the side of her when she was a passenger. She did a very major damage to her spine when we took her to a Macquarie specialist when she arrived back. I rang up the doctor and said, well, doctor, tell me what the story is. And he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Chris, but within five years, this lady will be in a wheelchair. Over the next year, she will be in such excruciating pain, she will have to be on high quality morphine tablets to stop her from becoming extremely agonizingly sick. I was completely destroyed with his words. I refused to accept what he had to say. And I said to him, Surely there must be some other answer. And he, and he said to me, the only other thing I can think of is a retired chiropractor who lives on Green Island in North Queensland. He was the best that he had never known. And this man may be able to manipulate Carol's back back into order. Within about six hours, we were on an aeroplane. I had left the business with some people. I had 23 staff in those days, trucks and all sorts of things. I was a high-flying young entrepreneur, grossing anything up to a quarter of a million dollars a month. Involved in drugs and bands and, and international people, it was all part and parcel of the same thing. But deep in my heart, I was trying to let my mother and father know, look, I am succeeding, I have achieved the goal that you set out for me, but not the way that you planned it. By now, obviously, the Australian Army had given up looking for me and I'd been discharged. And I had a freedom in some way. We arrived in Townsville, expecting to be back on Monday morning. It was Friday night. This man had a look at Carol's back and he said, look, I'm sorry. Unless you stay here for at least six months and let me work on this back, I can't be sure that I can do anything for you. My business was already in a delicate, fluctuating situation, as in as all rock and roll music industries. One minute it's making a fortune, the next minute you're bankrupt. And I was teetering on the edge of mismanagement because of the drugs and the bad people that I had employed with me, and a mismanagement and, a, and an arrogance of my own that presumed that everything would be okay, because I was so great. I stayed in Townsville with the little money that I did have and organised for some other funds to come up as well. And we settled down in Townsville with this man doing manipulation and various things on Carol's back. 
the six months was nearly over and he turned around and conceded that he couldn't do anything for her. By now she was taking extremely powerful morphine tablets, being druggy all over the place, argumentative, bitchy, misunderstanding my suggestions and ideas. Sometimes I would have to carry her to the toilet and the shower and the bathroom. It was a miserable life. And he said to me, David, I suggest that you get a spinal fusion. We will cut a couple of pieces of bone off the back of her bottom, stick it and wedge it into her spinal cord, and then she'll be able to walk, hopefully, without pain, but she will not be able to bend down because it will be fused together. We took that option. For the first time in my life, I found myself driving in a car while that operation was happening, crying out to a God I had never considered before. Oh God, I said, whatever you want of my life, whoever you are, whatever you are, please help my lady. I'll do anything. Please don't let her die. Please don't let it fail. Give her a fresh start in life. It's so unfair. I was in tears in that van. After the operation, a few days later, she came home. She was walking a little better. She sounded a little better, but she was still heavily on the drugs. I've forgotten what I'd said to God, if he ever existed or whoever he was or what manifestation of person he was. I was just pleased that her arguments weren't as loud and as powerful because the drugs had caused her to be a person I didn't know. But one night, only a few weeks later, I found her going really weird. She was sweating around the neck and was bowing down to this purple scarf. She was also praying to the moon in the backyard and making certain sacrifices and suggestions in the swimming pool and things like that to, to strange spirits. I was worried that the drugs had taken into a dimension that she'd gone nuts. All that I had hungered for was falling away from me. I went back to bed that night. I got a phone call in the morning and found that Carol wasn't in the house. She'd been arrested for running down the main park at three o'clock in the morning naked. She'd been put in a psychiatric hospital. She had become extremely sick. I didn't know what to do. I went to the hospital. She'd been certified by the police for 30 days. They had tried to calm her down from the drugs. She looked dazed on some other form of drugs when I got there. My whole life was collapsing around me. I was crying out to that God again, screaming in my heart. Two or three weeks later after her certification, she came home a little changed, a little bit more passive. And I settled down to the concept that, yes, she could walk around now. She didn't have as much pain, but she was hooked on these drugs that had sent her nuts. And I had to bear with the fact that the woman I loved, who was sharp, who could type several words a minute beyond my wildest dreams, who was an efficient personal secretary, was now a drugged, dependent, sick person. About a week later, there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door. And this man said, Excuse me, can I speak to Carol, please? And I got the shock of my life. There was this strange American man at the door. And I said, um, Yes, who, who is it? He said, My name's Pastor So-and-so from Texas, and I met Carol in the hospital, and I just wanted to come and visit her and see if she was all right. And I said, oh, well, that's very nice of you. Not really taking too much interest who he was, and I can't, couldn't even remember his name for this minute. I called out to Carol. I said, Carol, is it someone here to see you? And she came down, and I invited him in. And she looked at me enough to say, I, I, I don't remember this man. Who's this man? So he proceeded to explain to me that he used to visit her regularly every day at the hospital and just encourage her and care for her. I thought, what a nice man. Isn't he lovely? And then he started talking about 
how Jesus had sent him over from America to minister here in Townsville. And I got my hair up on my neck a little bit, thinking, now just slow down there a bit, pal. We're Jews, you know, we, we don't need this stuff. So I said to him, well, you know, we're Jewish. He said, you're Jewish? Well, praise God! And I thought, we've got a real flip out here. We've got a weird one. But there was something nice about him. And I couldn't help being thankful about the fact that he had come to visit. He said, well, I've got to go now. Is it okay if I can come back at some other time? I, and I said, well, sure, any time. Little did I know, I had now made it possible for him to come every week for six months. So he would come and he would visit. And then eventually he started on us. And he said, do you realize that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah? And I said, look, my family and what I understand is that Jesus is for the Gentiles. And I'm pleased for you. I'm really happy that you've got something to believe in. But we're the chosen people. I don't know what we're chosen for. In fact, my father used to say all the time, I wish he'd choose the Italians for a while. It's driving us crazy. Or someone else. But we're, we're, we're already locked into God. It's okay. You don't need to worry about us. But he would continue to say, but you don't understand that the Jewish people have had their eyes closed and blinded for a reason that the Gentiles might find the Messiah of Israel. And I said, well, look, you know, that's terrific, but we're really not interested. And that's really nice of you to sort of let us know. And you're welcome to come and visit. But, you know, sort of leave this thing alone. But every time that he came, he left these little booklets called tracks. They had little pictures in them and strange things. And I'd hand them over to Carol. And I knew that Carol was throwing them all in the bin. And we were all got a quiet smile on our face going, well, he's a really nice chap, but he's a little bit over the top. And we'll continue to invite him to have a cup of coffee, but we don't have to get involved in what he's saying. Well, the doctors had finished with Carol's back. They couldn't do anything more for her. She could walk now. Her drugs weren't quite as bad as they were. But there was something still not right with her. But I just put it away to one side and said, well, maybe that's the scarring in the soul or the heart because of all these drugs. Heavy, heroin-based drugs. It was time for us to pack up. They said that we couldn't do any more for you. We didn't really like Townsville very much anyway because it was a very industrial town. But just up the road, a little further, was Cairns, which was an environment to my liking. It was full of life and entertainment and surf and fishing and music. And I decided that we'd go up there and we'd set up an agency and we'd get started and get back to where we were. We could start again. I was confident. I was proud enough to presume that I could do whatever my mind set myself to. And I was still trying to prove to my parents that I could achieve this goal. So we packed up. We said goodbye to this man. And he said to me, look, do me a favour. You've got my phone number here. He said, I just ask you. I'll do a deal with you even, he said. I know that you're going back into the music business now. He said, if you can prove me wrong by the things I've said, I'll pack up all my religious beliefs and I'll come up and be one of your roadies and your discos and I'll take all the drugs and go out with the women and I'll do everything that you do. But if I can prove to you that I'm right, you'll give up what you're doing and you'll come and follow Christ like me. I said, yeah, 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 sure, that'll be fine. No problem, have a wonderful time, get out of my life, go away. That was my opinion of him. And I wished him goodbye and thanked him for all this time and this encouragement. And we packed up with a new excitement. We moved to Cairns and found a lovely place by the sea. And within two or three weeks, with determination, we had taken over a lot of venues and agencies and I'd rung down in Sydney and a lot of people had remembered me there and they let me book in the major bands so I could bring up people like Dragon and Midnight Oil and all the major shows. And Carol had decided to start a modelling agency, anything from the pictures of nails to faces to modelling to catwalking, to have facilities for the various advertising agencies that were in Cairns. And we were busy as anything. Carol was still in some form of sickness, still taking the drug very heavily, but at the same time, because we were active, we didn't notice and didn't get on each other's nerves as much. I had planned a way to book the bands for six weeks at a time, the local bands, so that by the time one week's effort had been made in booking all these bands, I had nothing to do for five weeks. And I was sitting in my office one night, about 10 o'clock at night, and I just happened to open the bottom drawer 
of my office desk. And there was a brown paper bag in there, and I couldn't for the life of me know what it was. And I opened it up and tipped it out on the desk, and there was some 50 tracks or more of what this Christian minister had given Carol to throw away in the bin. They were all over the desk, pictures, asking me questions. Do you know if you die tonight, would you go to heaven? Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I was incest in my heart. I was so angry that, that this man had caught up with me again. And I decided, right, I had made a deal with him. Now I was a booking agent again. Now I had bands coming back and forward. I was going to prove him that he was wrong and then I was going to make him a roadie in Townsville. I was excited. I had a great fire in my spirit that I was going to rip this man's religion apart and I was going to succeed in having him renounce his Christian position and become a roadie for me. And this was an exciting uh, desire for me to do and I had five weeks and nothing to do. So I went down to the library and I got Bibles and theological books and I decided that each one of these little booklets called Tracts, I was going to go one step at a time, all the little scriptural quotes, and I was going to find everything that was untrue and mark it and then ring him up and say, look, there you are. Carol could see that I was doing things and she didn't want anything to do with this because she was busy with the models in the daytime coming and going because her business was regular. And so I shut myself into the office and I began. And I took the first tract and started to pull it apart. It wasn't long before I started to become quite frustrated. There was no doubt historically that a man called Jesus existed. There was no doubt that some of the miraculous things that the scriptures in the Old Testament talked about did happen. Because we've even got now archaeologists and proven facts telling us of these cities that were destroyed and they found them destroyed and nations of people moving from one place to another because of the power of God. I was getting a bit frustrated. I was getting a little convicted too that this man at least had some knowledge about some things that I didn't. It started to bug me. Within about a week, I was starting to tremble inside. Something was convicting me to be more serious about what I was reading. My heart was pounding inside me. Don't brush this off. Don't brush this off. Three o'clock in the morning one morning, there I was in the office and these things were all around me and Bibles open everywhere. It dropped into my heart. The war was over. In my spirit, I knew that this person that they had called Jesus, who died on the cross, who then said he had raised from the dead, he really was raised from the dead. He really was the Messiah of Israel. As I began to shake inside, I felt this awesome presence start to walk into my office room. I was trembling with fear. It was standing right in front of me. And I felt as it was rain, droplets falling all over my body. I was shaking like a leaf. And I felt this presence saying, you are my son. You I give eternal life. I am the Jesus that you have looked for. I was broken. I was shaking. I was repenting. I was apologizing for all filthiness and, and my life and all the things that I had done. I was calling out, exposing myself as so sinful and unacceptable to God. How could he have touched me? How could he have anything to do with me? I was crying and shaking and breaking on the ground. There was a pool of tears all over the carpet. 15, 20 minutes later, I was deflated, practically worthless in physical energy. I couldn't even get up. I felt empty of everything. And then all of a sudden, I felt a new presence pour upon me. It was filling me up with something. It was like a bicycle pump in my heart. I was being refreshed. This presence was putting a smile, began to cry again and smile at the same time. Then I started to laugh. Then I started to rejoice and praise God in words I've never used before in my life. 
I stood up and walked around the office walls and slapped the, the pictures that were on the walls and said, I've been born again. The Messiah of Israel has saved my soul. And now I am a Jew indeed, not just by religion, but the Messiah has come and made me whole. And I was rejoicing and crying and laughing. There was a countenance upon me that's too hard to explain. It's more dynamic than falling in love for the first time. It's more beautiful than a child being embraced by its mother in love. It was all over me. And I felt protected by the God who owned everything. I felt so wonderful and yet so meek and so quiet and so fresh, so sinless, so forgiven. I burst into my wife's bedroom, shook her by the collar. I said, Carol, Carol, wake up quickly. You're going to hell. You've got to accept Jesus right now, quickly, quickly, quickly. And she looked at me and she said, Oh, look, stop smoking the marijuana at this time of the night. You've gone nuts. Leave me alone. Go to bed, will you? In my zeal, I'd gone, one might say, right off my tree. I continued to shake her and said, you've got to listen to me. God's here. Jesus is in the room. Jesus is of the Jews. We just don't know. We're blind. We, we've hardened our hearts. We, 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 we're undeserving. And so he's gone to a nation of people that do accept him are people who hunger to know the living God. That's why the Christians have him, because the Jews are uninterested. Carol, wake up, wake up. I spoke with her all night, got her up on the bed. By about six o'clock in the morning, she was in tears, wishing that she'd never met me. She had conceded that I had gone nuts. It was my turn. I had found religion and she said to my face, she said, I'd waited 30 years to meet a Jewish boy and marry him. And we're married and I'm seven months pregnant. And now you've become a Christian. Her whole life was dissolved in front of her face. She determined that morning that she was going to ring her father in England and leave me. She was packing her bags. I couldn't stop the zeal that was in my soul, whether I'd mismanaged God's will or not. The issue was it was pouring out of me like a water out of a tap. And I consumed my wife with the joy and the knowledge that I had. I was so excited. The problem was at 10 o'clock that very morning, which was Sunday, I too was playing music. And I was doing a country and western job at the largest outside country hotel in Cairns where some like 200 bikies used to come every Sunday and listen to me sing Kenny Rogers and Willie Nelson and many other country stars. And I'd become a regular there and they knew me very well and we got together and had ourselves a wow of a time with lots of cans of beer and get drunk and everything. But I determined I was going to preach the gospel to them at the cost of my job. So I left Carol crying not understanding me, sleepless, determined that her husband had gone crazy. I arrived at the hotel and I picked up the microphone and I said, all right, everybody, I want you to order orange juice. I want no one drunk this morning. We're going to have a church service. And all the bikies went, yeah, great, Dave. Tell us another one. What a great joke. Yeah. And they're throwing beer cans and having a wild time. Here come to church. Oh, glory be. And they were carrying on and making all sorts of wild noises and wolf whistles and all the girls were screaming and yelling. But they didn't realize I was serious. And I began to tell them what happened to me the night before and how they all needed to find Jesus. And they thought it was really funny for about three or four minutes. But after about five minutes, the manager of the hotel came to me and said, What do you think you're doing? You're going to destroy the whole day. Enough of this Jesus business. Get back to the music you're supposed to play. I said, I can't do that, John. I said, I'm telling the truth of what's happened to me. And I continued to preach more. And he said, right, that's it. You're fired. And it came over the microphone. I was fired. Now the bikies were angry. They were angry with me because I continued with the Jesus business, not singing their songs. And I got thrown out real badly. In the meantime, a friend of my wife's ran back to our house, which wasn't far away. And my wife was still sitting in a lounge chair from what I was reported and told, still upset with what had happened. And he said, you know what your husband's done this morning? She said, oh, he's just preached to the whole people at the hotel that unless they accept Jesus, they're all going to hell. He's been fired, 
and he's unrepentant about what he said. What's happened to him? My wife started to cry. She said, I'm leaving him. He's gone crazy. He's become some born-again Christian or something. He's refusing to do any of the bookings anymore because they're ungodly, they're, because they're, they're strippers and rock shows and stuff like that, and he, he won't do that anymore. And, and so they sat together for a while and just thought about these things. In the meantime, I decided not to go home. I was full of zeal about what I'd spoken at the hotel. There was, there was nothing in me that could stop me from carrying on the way I was. And I went down to the beach, and an afternoon on the beach, I had won eight people to the Lord. Hippies, bums, sitting on the beach. I had encouraged eight people to give their life to Jesus. I came back home that day and got all these tracks that had been left for me by the minister and I put them in my wife's bra and knickers and underpants and in the toilet roll so that wherever she went, wherever she went, they would pop out and hopefully convict her. I was determined to have her know the Messiah as well. I didn't know that I was driving even further crazy. I also had a vision one night whilst these things were happening. I saw myself in all my rabbinical clothes, dressed as a rabbi in front of thousands of people, Jews and Gentiles alike, and, and they were all wailing and crying and finding the Messiah. And I didn't understand. But it was such an awesome thing that happened to me. I didn't know about visions or any of these things. I didn't even have read the Bible properly yet. And I was excited. And I rang up the minister in Townsville who had first introduced me to these words about Jesus. And I told him I'd been saved. And he was so excited that he had brought a Jewish person to the knowledge of their own Messiah and Jesus Christ. And I said, and also I've had this vision and this dream. He said, oh no, that, that's of the devil. Forget the vision and the dreams. That, that's, that, that doesn't happen anymore. That, only, that stopped when the Bible was written. Don't, don't listen to that stuff. That's demonic. And I thought, well, what do I know? He, he, he's the one who told me how to get saved, and he was right, so I'll believe him. And I just ignored all those things. Anyway, it came time for Carol to pack her bags and to try, and for the life of us, with all the money that we had made and things that had happened and her parents, somehow, some way, we could not raise the money to send her back to England. It was an amazing thing. We could not raise it, but she was determined that she was finished with me. She was hurting badly. By now, there were some 30 people I had won to the Lord in Cairns. And we had our own congregation. We didn't know what we were doing. There wasn't even a minister out where we were living that could look after it. In fact, if I remember, by the time we left Cairns, there was over 60. The Lord had really blessed me and permitted me to see a lot of people come to his name. One day... Carol, in her desperation, realising that she couldn't get the money that she needed to leave, said, All right, God, I know my husband's not stupid. If it's really true what you're talking about, then send a bolt of lightning through the lounge room right now that Jesus is the, the Lord and I'll believe and then that'll be it. Well, of course, nothing happened. Not only did nothing happen, but she became more frustrated. A car pulled up outside, loaded with people, friends of hers. And they knocked on the door and she said, Oh, gee, I'm pleased to see you. David's gone nuts. And they said, Yeah, it's not wonderful. We've all believed too. Praise the Lord. We've all become Christians as well. And she slammed the door and she went into an absolute panic that even our best friends had turned to Jesus now. And she was one who was fighting with all her heart. She went into the bedroom this time. And she said, all right, I'll confess my sins. I'll acknowledge that you're a holy God and I'll come with respect towards you and ask you whether you really are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But there was one thing that she was unwilling to say and that was before she knew me, she had had an abortion. And her heart's attitude was, I'm not going to tell you that. You know I've had an abortion. Why do I have to tell you? I'm not going to confess that. I'll just confess that I've not being what I should be. I'm not as holy as you are and I ask you to forgive me and let me know Jesus, the Messiah, just like David knows. Well, nothing happened again. And she was upset and decided that's it. That's ridiculous. 
I was out one day witnessing and ministering to people. The business had stopped. We didn't know where money was coming from. I wouldn't have anything to do with what I'd done before. People were ringing up all the time saying, can I speak to David? And sh she would say, look, I'm sorry, he's feeling a bit sick at the moment. Could you ring in a couple of weeks time? She was trying to put them all off. She was feeling insecure and unsure of what was happening. She was seven months pregnant and her husband had thrown the business out the window. All sorts of things. I could understand how she was feeling, but these were the circumstances that we were in. And broken hearted, she went back into the bedroom. And she said, all right, all right, I confess. I've had an abortion. Forgive me. I confess that I'm, I'm a sinner. I confess that in my own right, I'm nothing in the sight of a pure and holy God. Forgive me and let me know whether Jesus is Lord. And then all of a sudden it happened. The presence of God came upon her. She became broken in heart. She burst into tears. And she received the presence of the Messiah into her heart. Born again of the promised holy seed. I came into the house and there she was with tears in her eyes and she embraced me and she said, it's true, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. At last, both of us now really are Jews. We received everything that God had planned for our people and we wept together for a long time. with excitement in our heart over the next few days of our new experience, of our new life, of the presence of a loving God encamping around us all the time, we were taken into a new dimension. Carol decided that we should go to England and witness and tell her parents all about the Jewish Messiah and how they could have him too. I wanted to go to Melbourne and tell my parents. We determined that these were the things we were going to do, so we packed up some clothes, managed now amazingly so to find some money to achieve these goals and firstly we proceeded down to melbourne i went to see my family and i appealed to them to listen to me to what i had to say and carol was with me by the time we had made this journey down south carol had already had our baby and it was a few weeks old and there we were in Melbourne for 11 days, appealing and pleading to my sister and my mother, my sister's husband and their children to listen to the amazing fact that the Messiah wasn't only just going to come as a person, as some ruler that the world would have peace through in one day, but firstly he had to come into the hearts and minds of the people and change their ways and their attitudes towards each other. So then he could be Lord in a literal sense in the days to come. And they wouldn't have it. But unbeknownst to me, my little nephew, David, who at that time was only about seven or eight, rushed upstairs. As I had asked them all, why don't you go upstairs and just ask with an honest and open heart, ask the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, whether this Jesus is the promised one that must come into our hearts first and rejuvenate us and reset us alive with God. Then he will come and rule over us in person. Little David came rushing down the stairs about 20 minutes later as my sister was adamant and ready to throw us out of the house. He said, Mummy, Mummy, it's true. I experienced God up there and I'm, I, I know that what Uncle David's saying is right. Oh, please, Mummy, listen, listen. My sister was so angry, so furious. She cast us out in the rain, baby and all, and we were left out there in the pouring rain. Some of the things that we must do and go through when we witness to our own Jewish people. Nevertheless, I was excited that one member of the family had found the promise that God had been waiting to give to his Jewish people all this time. And I hoped and prayed from that time on that that little David would sow a seed in my family's heart, who were so frightened to turn away from Jewish community thinking and how they might be banished Oh, the cost of a Jewish person finding their Messiah. Yet God warned them, it will cost you everything. But I will give it back to you a hundredfold if you will but bend the knee and find me. Carol and I left with excitement that someone was there and that work could go on at a later stage. We decided then to fly to England. As we arrived there at the airport, Carol rang her parents, but they already knew that she'd become one of these new Christians, and, and they refused her to come near the house. 
Eventually she convinced her father that she would come alone and I was left at a place where I could stay while she spoke to them about it. Having come 12,000 miles and being rejected, you'd think that Carol would have been destroyed, but she was determined. The spirit and the presence of the Messiah in her heart made her determined to go forth and try to help them find new life. I, in the meantime, found myself down in a small pub in a place called Luton, just out of London. And by the time I had finished in that pub and invited the people there, there was eight of them, to my home over a two-day period, the whole eight people got saved. It was a rejoicing thing. Black men and women, various unsaved people. The pub wouldn't let me back in again because I'd taken some of their clients away. Carol, in the meantime, had spoken to her father who was rigid and hard and wouldn't listen. But we decided to go and visit her brother who was in another part of England. And after spending a few days with him, he also gave his life to the Lord. We were seeing success. It was exciting. We then left England and flew to Israel. We went to Israel and we got to minister I began speaking in churches and places in Jaffa and Haifa and Jerusalem, having very little knowledge of the scriptures. But the Lord was with me and doing great things. On the way back from Israel, we were on an aeroplane on El Al. It was a 747 and the back half of the plane had all its chairs taken away because the Orthodox Jewish people would stand and pray and wave back and forward called davening right the way across the flight, across the Mediterranean, till they arrived in London. And we were stuck in seats where babies are kept in the middle aisle against a wall in front of us for where they hook babies up so that they can sleep. And for the whole seven or eight hour flight, I can't remember how long, a man was at the back praying and his wife was next to me. By the time she arrived at Heathrow Airport, she was saved, a Jewish woman believing that Jesus was the Messiah. By the time the man came back to his seat, he was so angry with me and murderous in spirit that he was warning to get back with me. I left him our number in London. He rang, prepared with friends and brethren, with Orthodox rabbis and others, to tear apart my Jewish Christian belief, to try and get his wife back into the faith of the Jewish faith. By the time that meeting finished, the husband gave his life to the Lord. And the other men that had come with all their rabbinical books had walked away confounded. We began to fly back to Melbourne. On our way, we had to stay at Kuala Lumpur. While we were at Kuala Lumpur, the servant who cleaned our room gave his life to Jesus. As we arrived in Singapore, ready to go from Singapore straight to Cairns in Queensland, the Lord said to my spirit, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to Melbourne. As I arrived in Melbourne, we settled down there, realizing that although Carol had become the same as me, there was still some apparent sickness. There was still occasional tablet taking. There was still some concern in my heart that something wasn't right with her. And I had realized that the Bible did talk about strange things happening to people, but I couldn't understand it. And I just left it alone. We settled down in Melbourne and we found the same denominational group that had introduced us to Jesus in Queensland and we immediately attached ourselves. Letters came from that Queensland group encouraging the local church to support us, that they felt that I was evangelistic and to give me an opportunity as an outreach to the Jewish community through this church in Melbourne. We continued to go on in boldness, yet still with sin and failings, but we were unified. We had something. Yet, as I said before, there was something that wasn't right with Carol that I couldn't pick. But I left it alone because 90% of our effort and our motivation was unified. And this is a great thing in itself, better than I'd ever had before. So we began to evangelize to the Jewish community and the local people, for it was both our God-given determination that we would not live another breath without letting the Jewish people of this country, if not the world, know that the heartache and the hurt that they're going through and the burden of orthodox religiosity and the loss of not knowing God was all because they wouldn't humble themselves and accept the Jesus that the Gentiles had been holding 
for 2,000 years. And all because God came to his Jewish people to give them Jesus, and they rejected him. And so he went to the Gentiles and found a new chosen people that he could love and embrace for eternity. And here we were, hungry and excited that we were going to do our best to present this wonderful offering and free will offering from God to our people. As we began to have home groups and Jewish uh, prayer nights, one night a lady came. She was a very nice lady. And as we got our hymnals out, as most of you Christians will understand the difference between a charismatic, a Pentecostal and an evangelical Christian. We started to sing some old hymns, for surely we were evangelical. And we had been warned to keep away from charismatic and Pentecostal Christians. In fact, not only warned, but the doctrine of our church was that they were demonically possessed people and we should have nothing to do with them. They were the final lying signs and wonders of this age. All of a sudden, this woman put up her hands and started praising God in a strange sound. Fear gripped Carol and my heart. We were in absolute panic. We didn't know what to do. I tried to constrain myself, and at the end of the meeting, when we were having a cup of tea, I came up to her. She seemed such a nice lady. But I went into another room, and I rang the pastor, and I said, What do I do? And he said, get her out of the building immediately. She's one of those demon-possessed people. If you have anything to do with her, I will bar you from being an outreach of our church. You must command her to leave now. And I spoke to Carol. And I said, Carol, look, the pastor's told me to do these things. Well, obey, she said, obey. But something in my heart wouldn't let me do it. Fortunately enough, it was the end of the night and she left. And I hoped and prayed that she wouldn't come back the next week because I was getting squeezed into a corner. And the pastor and the elders came over and warned me again and said, if this woman turns up, you are commanded now by your elders to keep her away from this building. Surely enough, next Tuesday night came. She turned up praising God, singing praises. I was in terrible fear. Carol was extremely angry with me and said, why don't you kick her out like the pastor said? Something in my heart couldn't do it. Of all the strange things that we've been taught about these strange people, Something in me said, but that's not the way. Surely, even if she was wrong, surely if she was on the wrong track, shouldn't we embrace her and love her and care for her and encourage her to turn to the way of the Lord? Carol rang my pastor. He came the next day and banned the fellowship. I was excommunicated. I was not permitted to enter the church until I repented of such things. Carol wouldn't speak to me. That very night I was so burdened, I didn't sleep with my wife. I went into the spare room and at about one o'clock in the morning I began to cry at the end of the bed. I said, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I want to obey you. These people have brought me to the knowledge of you. I'm hungry to serve you with all my heart and soul. You've seen how I've been willing to lose family and friends, to be annihilated by Jewish verbal anger and hatred, to even have had bomb threats on our telephone lord i say to you now if this woman is wrong get her out of our lives and let us go on for you but if she's right i'm willing to be rejected by them all if she has something i need to know then let it happen to me now before i'd finished my breath the presence and the power of the holy spirit beyond my wildest dreams poured down upon me in that room it caused me to roll over and over in my bed with such spiritual ecstasy and love flowing over, as Paul says in the scriptures, a flowing over of the love of God that I could not even stand for six hours. I began pouring down upon me was an experience that caused me just to say, praise you God, praise you God. I was enveloped with a form of love which now I understand as the Bible calls a God of love. And if we don't feel him, what God of love is this? There he was, manifesting himself. And in the middle of the room, a voice spoke to me against all the things that I'd been taught, telling me that I'd been chosen, that I was an called apostle to the Jews and to the nations of this world. And if I will forsake all things and follow him, I will be found worthy to do this work. Having not slept all night, 
I started walking down the hall because it was time to get up. The rest of the family were about. But there was a cheesy grin on my face and a joy in my heart. And I couldn't help but know that I knew something so dynamic, another additional dimension in God that Carol and I had always been taught to keep away from. She said, good morning, how are you? I said, I'm fine. And dashed into the bathroom, praising God. Could not control myself. I had promised her this morning that I would take her to a trash and treasure meeting just to have a look at some rubbish that we might want to buy, some bits and pieces. I'd forgotten to buy petrol. And I was trying to contain the joy that was inside my heart. I had been, as the scriptures had said, filled with the Holy Spirit. It was another thing. It wasn't a lie. And we had been taught to keep away from such a thing. But God had shown me in the words he spoke to me in that bedroom that I needed this, this zeal, this power, this finishing touch to be able to go into that dimension of work for him. There I was driving down the highway on the way to the trash and treasure and all of a sudden we ran out of petrol. I had forgotten. The children were in the car. By now I had two children. Carol was just sitting there waiting for me to do something about it. And here was my first opportunity to be able to lift up the bonnet. And whilst the bonnet was open, I was praising God and hallelujahing and going as crazy as you could imagine. I was full of the joy of the Lord. And she'd say, well, what's the matter? What's the problem? Oh, it'll be all right, darling. It won't be a minute. And then I was in there again, praising God and speaking in other languages and, and things that I hadn't been taught. They were coming from within my soul. Eventually after... Having been to the trash and treasure, she said, there's something wrong with you. What's the matter? And I said, I've got to tell you something, Carol. To be honest, the lady that came on Tuesday night, she's the one that's right. We're wrong. I came before God that night, and he filled me with some inexpressible joy called being filled with the Holy Spirit. I offered myself to him, to this foolishness that we've been taught to keep away from. And now, unbeknownst to me, I speak in another spiritual language. Not only that, but there's something inside me, more boldness than, our, than I can ever explain to you. Immediately she went to the telephone. She rang the pastors. And unbeknownst to me, they had organized an exorcism because they believed I had now been possessed by a demon or more demons. In my zeal and my joy, this didn't offend me. They said, would you come up to the church tonight, David? We would like to do an exorcism. I said, sure. No problem. Carol was in fear and trembling. I can imagine her mind now as I look back, how fearful and how worried she was because she was now just as hard as the day that I got saved. The day I gave my life to the Messiah, she was hard. Now another dimension in God and she had closed her heart and gone hard again. She was willing to make the first move, but all of a sudden the second move she wouldn't come to. I went to that meeting that night and they made me sign contracts to tell the devil to leave and all sorts of strange things. And I was rejoicing in my spirit. I said, I've been here four hours now. You've done all you wanted and here I am. You know my heart. Please ring up my wife and tell her that I'm not possessed of a devil. And her husband is coming home who loves her just as much. But some magnificent God thing has happened to his life. As I drove home, which took 40 minutes, they rang up and informed her that the demons didn't leave and they recommend that she leave the house right now with the children and drive up to one of the deacon's homes and stay there and keep away from me until the demons are taken out of my life. Some two or three weeks later, my son died at seven months old, a cot death. I'd like to inform you now that it's been five years since my wife went to that deacon's home and we have been separated ever since. She writes and curses me in newsletters, in papers, in documents, in churches, confounding me as a man who has left his wife and children for a spiritual experience. I cried to God when I got home that night, only to be told that I shouldn't be let in. I went and stayed somewhere else for several days. And I cried to God. I said, Lord, you've done this wonderful thing. You said that I'm this and I'm that and I'm the other. And, and I don't even know what the future of those things are yet. But what about my wife, Lord? What about my wife who needs to be my side? And I cried and I cried and I cried. 
And then one evening, whilst my wife was now already at the deacon's home, and I was broken hearted that my God wouldn't answer me, a strange experience happened. I experienced something coming up the stairs of where I lived. And it came into my bedroom. It was so powerful, it was so authoritative, it was so electrifying to my soul, I felt like I was going to die. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord had sent an angel or himself to minister to me. It was pouring with rain outside. I was lying on my bed, crawling in the corner from the, the electricity of the holiness that was sitting in front of me. I tried to get away from it. And as I did and ran down the hall, it followed me. And as it followed me, unfolding in my eyes, like the hallway disappeared. And what fell in front was a complete visual vision. My eyes was now traveling into the church that my wife was at, which I was now banned from, which I could now not even park into the, the, the car park without being told to leave. And as I walked down this aisle in the center of this church, people fell over from the power of the Holy Spirit. My wife, demons and spirits poured out of religious people screaming and yelling as I walked down the center of this hall. I stood up at the pulpit and began to speak to this evangelical church and appeal to them to die now to this religious belief and to submit now to the Spirit of God and have the fullness of the presence of God come and he would forgive them. A blind man with a dog was sitting at the front and I touched his eyes and he could see. Another man lurched out at me ready to grab me and fell on his face out cold or passed out or something in front of me. People were wailing and screaming. And people started coming to God in brokenness. And then the vision stopped. And I said, all right, all right, all right, I see it. I understand this is an answer. One day, somehow, maybe next week, next day, this will happen. Thank you. But he chased me down the stairs. And the vision started again. And I ran away from this, this angelic spirit or the Lord himself, whoever it was. And I ran out into the rain pouring out on me at three, four o'clock in the morning. And the vision started again a third time. And I said, all right, all right, all right, I see it, I see it. And then all of a sudden he left. And there I was standing out in the middle of the rain, overwhelmed with the answer that God had given me. Somehow, some way, some day, my wife would be delivered of her fear. The church that I longed to have set free would be broken and things would happen. I accepted it and woke up the next morning conceding there was nothing else for me to do. There was no church to go. There was a wife that lived in absolute fear of my presence. Several months later, when I even came to a birthday party for my son, the deacons and the pastors wouldn't let me touch him or wish him happy birthday with a kiss because I might pass demons onto his life. But the Lord was saying to me, it's not me that's oppressed but my wife and my children. And the demonic oppression on my wife was from those drugs ages ago in cans, that although she'd found the Lord, she was not washed completely clean. And religious spirits and other spirits had control over her life. But he had taught me to leave her alone, and in his time, he would sort it out. I went about evangelizing. I went about confidently. I fell into false doctrine. I upset a lot of people because I spoke out of turn and out of place and from a hurting heart. I had a wrong attitude towards women's ministry and many other things, striving to stay alive and yet knowing that I was separated from my little children and my wife because God was working out a purpose in my life. As I cried to him and said, How long, Lord? How long, Lord? He reminded me in my heart, are you willing to forsake all things? Would you lose family, friends, possessions, even your integrity? Would you let me bring the church against you to ridicule you and mock you and reject you so that you become dead, crucified like my son? And I had remembered that I said yes. Then he said, on that day, I will give you back a hundredfold. But now look away from these things and follow me. And here I stand before you this day, testifying that God loves me enough to destroy me 
for the purpose that the desire of my heart might be that I might really serve my God the way He wants me to. That He is purging me and taking things from me, using the things I love to destroy, to annihilate, and then to rebuild. If, if you're a Jewish person listening to this tape today, I urge you to realize that you cannot please God in any good works. You cannot stand on the fact that you're a Jew the day you die and God will be pleased with you. For there is no one in this world who has done anything that will fully satisfy God's way of thinking. He's pure. He's wonderful. He's merciful. He's forgiving. We're not that. We're hard-hearted. We're embittered from many years of torment and anti-Semitism. You cannot enter the promised kingdom that the Jewish people hope for with an embittered, hurting heart, with vengeance with lies, willing to crush everything to keep our Jewishness alive. How will you get this out of your heart? How will you stand before the Messiah and the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and feel clean? How could you let that anger and that bitterness enter and walk in the halls of God's house? Do you think he would let you? Would you let someone with filthy feet and disgusting clothes pour mud all over your house? Would you not ask him to clean his shoes outside first? A Jewish person, I say to you, as hateful as it may seem to your heart, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach, which is the same words in Hebrew, is the Messiah to the Jews. Yes, it is impossible for you to believe. And, and as difficult as it may seem, it is only because our pride would not receive him 2,000 years ago that our Jewish people today are too arrogant and too proud and unable to humble themselves to accept the fact that the Gentiles that we sometimes mock and laugh at and the Christians who we can't understand actually have the jewel and the crown of the Jewish faith. I appeal to you as you leave this tape tonight, go to your closet, go to your bedroom and ask, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Is this Jesus that David has spoken about truly the Messiah? For I assure you, your life depends upon it. Your children's children depend upon it. For without the Messiah, even the scriptures of the Jewish scriptures talks about hell and terrible destruction for those who have rejected the opportunity that God has given through the terrible pain that the Messiah went through to set us free. Do you think that you will go uncharged for that? Do you think that the Son of God could come and pay excruciating pain for you and you not accept it and then things would still be okay? I appeal to you. If you're a Christian today, you're evangelical and you don't believe in all this gifts and mishmash, I say to you, you will stand before your God. And having heard this tape, it will be a testimony against you that you could have asked God. You could have appealed to Him with your pride and your anger. Yes, the church might tell you to get lost. Your family might even ridicule you. But the Word of God says, if anybody will not forsake all things and follow me, he's not worthy of me. I appeal to you, Christian. Either be a complete Christian or be nothing. For surely... There is not a great future for a man who will take the form of Christianity that he likes and think that he can fully get away with that when he stands before God. There will be a cost. My friend who doesn't know God today, if you've listened to this tape, my heart goes out to you. This has been a frightful testimony. I ask you one thing. Don't let anybody steal this away from your heart today until you ask a God you do not know he'll listen to you if your heart will say well if there is a God of David and if he does exist let me know whether this is true that's all he wants to hear from your heart not your head now but an honest gentle heart don't expect that you have to give up drinking and smoking and and sleeping around and all you can't do these things 
He wants you to come the way you are and find Him. He will wash you. He will change your heart. You will have a newness. If I can help anybody who has listened to this tape today, or if any of the team of Hope of Israel Ministries is a useful to you, please ring us with the name on the box and the phone number. May the Lord touch all those who hear this tape. Shalom. As I stand here this morning ready to give my testimony on how I came to know the Messiah of Israel, Jesus, I just want to say if there are any Jewish people in the audience today, this might be offensive to you. And I can understand that. My mother was very much that way. But I ask you just right now, just to put those things aside for a minute, to open your heart and just to listen to another person's point of view. If you're a Christian here today, having come from various denominations from the country or